in Sunday school, some children were asked to draw a picture of the nativity scene and give it to their parents for Christmas to adore and display on their refrigerators. And a mom took a look at her daughter's drawing and saw a heavyset bearded character over to the side in addition to the normal cast of characters. Well, she was concerned that her daughter was mixing a secular story in with the sacred. And so she pulled her aside and said, I love the drawing that you've done. And uh, this must be Joseph. And, and this is Mary and baby Jesus and the animals. Sweetie, um, who is this other kind of large person over here to the side? Well, her daughter kind of sighed and blurted out, you know, Mommy, that's Round John Virgin. Sometimes kids get things a little bit confused. I think we'll see this morning that different people will have different takes on the very same story. That people will hear of what's happened there in the town of Bethlehem, but not everyone is going to be excited about the coming king and view it as good news. You know, each one of us that's gathered this morning came with an ache within our heart, right? Right? I mean, I, I suppose you can be so lost or so distracted that, that you don't realize that it's there. But for the rest of us, we know that, that deep within us, God has, has put this kind of holy ache within us, something that, that's kind of missing, that's designed to draw us closer to Him. And God put this within us, and, and, and we're longing to, to draw closer to Him, to somehow be filled with His presence. But if we read in Hebrews chapter 11, the great men and women of faith, they would tell you that this longing could be somewhat satisfied, but not completely in this world, but only in the world to come. What does God do? What does God do to help us to fill this void? I believe he gives us joy. He fills our hearts and our souls with joy. And you know, like when we had talked about hope and we talked about peace, we can, can experience joy in the present based on what Christ has done for us in the past and also the promise of his return in the future. That is the source of our joy. That's where we get it. But at times, can't joy kind of be somewhat elusive? I mean, especially if we base our joy on externals because everything just has to go just right in order for us to experience joy. And rarely does it go just right. I want to illustrate this morning by, by talking a little bit about maybe going on a family vacation. You, you, know, you know, you have in your mind what you think it's going to be like. And, and what could be more joyous than spending time away from our, our busy work schedules and, and carting kids around and stuff and just spending time with the people that we love the most and have uninterrupted time with them. Well, on a recent family trip to go down to Texas to see uh, Jill's relatives, we, we made the mistake of, of trying to take our little dog, Toby, with us. Uh, well, we got kind of a late start on, on our trip, so we had to stop at the Best Western in Meridian, Mississippi. Why the Best Western? Well, not only was it a cheap option, but it was the only pet-friendly uh, hotel in town. And I discovered the hard way you don't cut across the grass at the only pet-friendly hotel in town. But a, as we were kind of moving our stuff in, we noticed that the gal next to us had not one, not two, but four large dogs. And I should have known that this was going to be quite an evening for us. Well, to add to our enjoyment, there was a motorcycle touring group that also took advantage of the budget-friendly terms there at the hotel. And so all throughout the night, all we heard coming and going was the roaring of Harley pipes. And every time, it started a chorus of barks and howls. Well, Toby had a blast with his newfound friends. Kids slept right through it. And Jill and I, let's just say our joy meter was on zero the next morning. Well, let's see if we can't raise that joy meter up a little bit today as we talk about the birth of Christ in Luke chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, turn with me. Because as we'll see, joy is not found on the outside. Joy comes from within. Well, since the moment of the fall, man has tried to reconnect and trying to understand the mysteries of the Creator. But how can we? How, how can man do it with he's mortal, uh, he's limited, and he's a finite creature? 
If you look in scriptures, no tower could be built or, or bridge erected to get us into the presence of God. And even if man found a way to, to make their way into the presence of God, how could he survive? How could he relate? He doesn't have the aptitude to comprehend the unutterableness and, and otherness of God. Job found this out the hard way. We also look at the story of Moses and say, well, well Moses got close but even Moses fell short. The truth is that if this relationship the man has been seeking is going to be reestablished, it's going to have to come from the other side, coming over to join in our world to connect with us. And that's exactly what takes place. Most of us are familiar with the story. Caesar Augustus issues a decree. You know this. Everyone in the empire was, was to come and to be counted, I'm sure, for taxation purposes. And so you have every head of household that is returning to his hometown of origin for registration. And so you, you've got uh, this young father-to-be named Joseph, and he's left his hometown in Nazareth, and he's got with him his betrothed wife, Mary, and they're making this arduous journey from Nazareth all the way back to Bethlehem. And, you know, they were technically married, even though they're not functioning as husband and wife. But as you know, uh, through the, the gift and the power of the Holy Spirit, she's with child anyway. And so they come rolling into town right about the time that it's time for her to have her child. And so there's no suitable place for them uh, to do this. And so they, they find shelter in a cave or in a barn. And there they have Jesus. And the Savior of the world is born into us. And it's just incredible. And there's no crib for a bed but a manger suffices to hold the King of kings, the Lord of lords, God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. All that's happening. And suddenly, we were given privy to a divine knowledge of this is what God looks like. If you've ever wondered about what he's like and, and, and who he is and what he's about, it's now come in flesh in Jesus Christ right here being born in this manger. As Gary Carver said, God moved down the stairway of the stars and entered history in the form of a little baby. He became one of us, grace upon grace, truth upon truth, that we can relate with him. So this is a story that, that we all know. It's a story in a nutshell. But one other part of this first Christmas story that we have to examine is the reaction of those that encountered this. The ones that were closest, that were there on the scene, to see how we can react and maybe some of our possibilities. Phillips Brooks described it beautifully in the song that Lincoln led us in uh, earlier in this service, talking about the little town of Bethlehem, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. So we see kind of the, this double reaction of the hopes, the things that we're longing for, but also when we're confronted with God among us, it brings about fears. We'll get to that later. I want us to start first with what we're familiar with and what you would think would be the natural reaction in Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby. Now, just imagine being one of these guys, keeping watch over their flocks at night. I, I'm guessing that if it's at night, you probably got one that's kind of watching and maybe the others are, are, are kind of taking turns on different shifts, getting some shut-eye. But they're out there with their sheep. And an angel of the Lord appears to them. It's been hundreds of years since this has happened. And the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. Too late, I'm sure. I bring to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them, gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had 
been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed what the shepherds, uh, what the shepherds had said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorified and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. I don't know about you, but can you imagine being out there on, on that cold night and then just having the, this happen and experiencing this thing? It must have been so disorienting and, and, and not knowing exactly what's going on. And, and not just to have an angel there, but then to be joined by a whole chorus of angels just bellowing this out. And you're just thinking, no one's going to believe me. No one's going to, how do I even describe what just took place? But these guys are, are, do, are seeing this totally out of the blue. And they hear the angels say, glory to God in, in the highest heaven on earth. Peace to those who favor rest. What an amazing sight and sound that must have been. I mean, I, I, it, it's just hard to put it into words. And you, you just imagine trying to be out there. No wonder the shepherd said, hey, if, if this is true, we've got to go check this out. God's own child here among us. And where, where did he say he was going to be? Well, we're going to go into Bethlehem. So, you know, they, they make their way in and experience this. And they, they see the Christ child for themselves. And they told everyone that they encountered what the angels had told them and that it, it, everything that they had seen. And people were amazed at what, peop, what the shepherds had told them. Now, I'm sure that there were some friends and family that kind of listened to them with skepticism. I mean, these guys were shepherds. It's not exactly the highest point on, on the whole uh, working chain here of professions. But can you take their, their testimony seriously? I mean, angels, it, it had been hundreds of years since there had been any encounter. And so they, they had this angel sighting here. And the story is the baby of all babies. It is here in Bethlehem. And he's lying at a feeding trough. I mean, it's just amazing. And so if we were to take this story on face value, just separate from the life of Jesus, you would think these guys are crazy. But when we start looking and reading further about this boy that grows up, we start reading about his teachings, we start seeing the things that he did and the ways that he cared for people, it makes perfect sense. The way he died for us, the way he rose from the grave, it was the most natural way for Jesus to begin his life and enter this world for the most beautiful story ever told. You know, Luke tells us that Mary treasured up these things in her heart. That she's taking all this in. It's confirmation from another source, not just this angel, but there's been a further revelation to her, to her husband-to-be, Joseph. And, and now these, these common shepherds coming in and sharing the same thing. She knows in her heart that God is using her to bring this about. And this child is special. This child will be there to glorify and praise God. She experiences joy from within, a joy that couldn't be quelled. Well, about five and a half miles up the road in Jerusalem, there was a completely different take on what took place. See, alongside the shepherd's reaction to joy, there was a response of terror as well. The text tells us, in particular in the palace of Herod the king, something deep within this tyrant was there that just started seething and it became a threat to him and a couple months later when the wise men travel from the east and arrive they don't immediately go to to bethlehem first they, they go to the palace and he starts telling and, and starts asking the questions about this and this thing that had been seething and brewing grew into a frenzy an all-out blood bloodbath taking the life of any child there in Judea that might pose a threat to his throne. So we see within this same event a vastly different response to what God has done here. So we, we see the highest of highs and, and the joy of the shepherds. And then you see this fear that's manifested in such evil activities. And it, it's hard for us to understand that how, how this could happen but sometimes we start looking at our own lives and we start seeing that maybe this is a reaction that we understand because we start looking at the way that we react to God and sometimes we want to draw close to him and we, we want to be into his presence 
But there are times we want to take a step back and we want to resist His Lordship in our life. You know? There are parts of us that want to be guided by God's truth. There's some times we don't like the truth that we uncover. When we start looking at Scripture saying, oh, this is what discipleship is all about. And we rebel against God's authority because we allow Him to have it. He enters our lives and He demands change. He demands for us to live differently. James talks about this encountering the truth in, in his, his letter. And he talks about that when you look at the truth, it's like looking in a mirror. And as you're, you're examining it, you see truth, this holy, pure thing from God, and you see your life for what it is. He said the easy thing to do is just say, yep, yep, that's truth, and we walk off. But James says, no, you stay there. You keep examining that truth and, and what it reveals to you in your life, and you say, I want to make changes. I want to become more and more like Jesus Christ. That's what he's calling us to do. But it's difficult. Sometimes we don't want to do that. Sometimes we just want to walk away. So within us, there, there's this battle going on that the hope of the shepherds that have found this baby in Bethlehem, I mean, that's exciting. But also the fear within the palace walls of our hearts, like Herod's, that because our spot on the throne is in jeopardy, we want to take a step back. In his spiritual autobiography, Surprised by Joy, C.S. Lewis openly admits the conflict in his heart. You know, on the one hand, Lewis admits that his life's calling was to, to find himself in the presence of God. And, and he, he felt like if, if he could draw closer and closer to God, then he could experience and possess this supernatural joy that comes from being united with God once and for all. But he found himself that when God be, began to reveal himself in the message in the life of Jesus Christ, he found himself resisting. He found himself taking a step back, and he's like, I wanted this so desperately, but as God started revealing himself, I, I wanted to be left alone. I wanted my life to be free and to do things as I saw fit and to, to experience God on my terms. He knew instinctively if he let God into his heart that Christ would come in as Lord. And Lewis couldn't keep living and doing life business as usual. This is what C.S. Lewis wrote. At times I felt like saying, oh, I hope Christ is the truth about God and I'm afraid he's not. And at other times, I felt like saying, I am afraid Christ is the truth about God, but I hope he's not. So becomes the inconsistency of the human heart. We begin this journey. We wrestle. We long to, to find God at, at the end of our journey, but sometimes we're fearful of what we're going to find as we travel along that. Oh, we, we want joy belong beyond measure that, that is described here and, and is promised to us. We just don't know if we want to live at that level of discipleship in order to attain it. it it's too difficult to give up my life. It's too difficult to say, I want to, to live out what, what Jesus preached on the Sermon on the Mount, but yet he tells us, do it, live it, become this kind of person. We don't know if we're ready to do that, so we resist. Phillips Brooks got it right. In his song about Bethlehem, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Several years ago, I had the opportunity while traveling in Israel to go to the town of Bethlehem with our group. And I really didn't know what to expect as we went to this church of the nativity. And we waited in, in a long line, it seemed forever, but finally we started making our way down through a series of caves. And as we came upon the traditional spot that they say that the birth of Christ took place, I found that my heart wasn't prepared for it. It, it just wasn't. And I, I found myself kind of taken back and hushed by the holiness of the moment, the holiness of, of the experience and the place. And there were candles lit all around us. A couple hundred folks were there on the damp floors of this cave, a lot of them down on their knees in prayer. From behind me, someone in our group started singing, O Holy Night. And then it was O Little Town of Bethlehem. And finally, Silent Night, that I just broke down. But 
joining in the chorus were people from Europe, from Asia, other folks from the United States that were with us, fellow pilgrims that were there. And we sang together there in this cave. And it was just incredible. It was one of the most sacred moments of my life. See, the, the Christmas story has power. It has power over humanity. And the, the simplest of, among us can e experience the joy and understand it. And the wisest among us never grow tired and exhaust this story of God coming to his creation and opening the door for our salvation. This morning we have to ask ourselves, what's our response? It, is it one of joy? Is it one of fear? Will you be like the shepherds that experienced something that their heart and soul had been longing for and when they found it, they ran, left everything they were doing to go and see what God was doing among us? Or will we lean to be more like Herod, desperately trying to hold on to the life that we've crafted and built and have done everything to attain? Because we, we really can't pursue both. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 25, Jesus says, for those who, who want to save their life, you're going to lose it. And for those who lose their life on account of me, you're going to find it. You know, whether the place that we visited on that day in our tour group was the place where Jesus was born, there, there's no way to, to determine that. But there was joy in that place because there's joy in that story. You know, if, if that joy is missing in your life, you, you understand this idea of the ache that can't be filled by externals, please come talk with us. Our shepherds and staff would be available for us and uh, available for you to tell you the story of all stories about how God desperately wants to be in relationship with you. And if you're ready to partner with him in the waters of baptism, certainly that's available as well. What will your response be? I encourage each of us to pursue the joy that the angels announced. Pursue the joy that the shepherds proclaimed that today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to us. 